What kind of interview is this? Did you manage to do a hack at like that kind of distance or like a mile or two? Or? It looks like the bottom of a lightsaber. And if you're not feeling subtle, and if you also have uh, the double threat that somebody might, you know, break into your home and you would need to like beat them to death with your wireless network adapter. I've got to ask this question because I'm sure many, many people are thinking about it. Hey everyone, David Bumble back with a very, very special guest, Cody, welcome. Thank you very much, I'm excited to be here. Cody, so you're very well known in the community, but you know, in case some people don't know who you are, could you tell us who you are, a bit of your background and sort of what your passions are? Sure, my name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher and I have been making educational hacking content on first the Nullbyte channel and now the Hack5 channel for probably like four or five years now. My specialty is Wi-Fi hacking and OSINT, so doing online research. And I do a lot of stuff, but I particularly like teaching beginners because I myself am a beginner and I did not start with a background in hacking. I think we have 35 million views on the Nullbyte channel. Getting to be in front of that many people teaching ethical hacking concepts has been both really difficult and really rewarding. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what I do. I've got to ask this question because I'm sure many, many people are thinking about it. Are you still part of Nullbyte? Are you going to be part of that channel? Are you going to be there? Or have you got some other YouTube channels? Uh, can you give us an update? Yes. So I started as a writer for the Nullbyte website with pretty much zero experience in hacking. And eventually I became the editor and I I turned around and said, hey, if we want to stay current, if we want to stay relevant, we need to make video content. And they were like, no, you shouldn't do this. It is too expensive. <laughs> um, you know, it's not going to wow. work out. So I was just like, I, I had a friend who had just graduated from school who was really excellent at video editing. And I was like, let's do a project together. Like, let's start something um, and make it our best work so that we can really, really like pour our energy into something cool. So we made the first couple of videos. We put a lot of thought into them. And that was Nullbyte. Eventually the company was like, all right, all right. We acknowledge that these are doing better than the articles. We're going to pay you like $200 for two people to produce a single piece of content, which sometimes would take like a couple days. Um, we would get to split $200. You should have worked at McDonald's or whatever. You would have made more money. Yeah, exactly. So it really was not a very profitable thing and it, it really stressed us out. But eventually we really started getting yeah. some traction. And after a while we had videos that had millions of views. And that's when we had one of our videos taken down by YouTube and we got a strike. You're crazy hacker. This got some press attention. Um, it was in like uh, Bloomberg and a bunch of other like random kind of like businessy like publications. The company I work for now, Verona, saw that our content was being, let's just say, not appreciated at the moment by YouTube. And while it was eventually restored, Nullbyte got into, or rather the parent company got into some financial trouble and they made it so that they stopped ordering episodes from us at the beginning of the pandemic. So they just weren't willing to pay us to make content anymore. So we could either keep making it for free or we had to find something else. So we started making content on the Hack5 channel, which has been great. They've been an excellent audience and also a, just it's amazing to have someone who's been doing this for such a long time kind of guide us through the process of making new types of content. And then Veronis is my day job. So I get to do live streams twice a week now, which is super cool. And one of them is just a Q&A stream. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. So the phone is basically like using its maximum transmission power to like download these like huge files over and over and over. So I'm gonna go ahead and verify that this is the person we're talking about by checking the link here. We can even see that we've got their passport number. How does Thomas feel about the installation of Blackheart? Does he feel like it was uh, excessively complicated and that the errors were confusing? Or does he feel like this is something that beginners could sink their uh, claws into? The fact that I get to hang out with some of my best friends, talk to hackers and answer questions from beginners, and that's like part of my job, is honestly the kind of the best result of all of this. So no bite is no more, but uh, better things have come. I believe you've got a, a, a project that you've been working on, and I wanted to talk to you about that. And I also want to talk to you about like, I've got a whole bunch of alpha adapters here because people always ask me this question <laughs> and seeing that Wi-Fi is one of your <laughs> your favorite topics. I want to you know, get your input about Wi-Fi specifically, but also microcontrollers. So can you tell us about this? Is it the Wi-Fi nugget that you've created? Yeah, yeah. So great, excellent question. So the Wi-Fi nugget is kind of the culmination of my two fascinations which is Wi-Fi hacking and microcontrollers. Wi-Fi hacking has always been interesting to me because Wi-Fi is so universal. And I didn't realize until I started learning more about it that it's actually super fragmented. Like Wi-Fi is more of a suggestion than it is a standard in some cases. And in order to call something Wi-Fi, manufacturers can still have a lot of flexibility in terms of what things they do or don't implement or the way they implement them. So the actual like variation 
in different devices and how uh, devices use Wi-Fi or are vulnerable to different Wi-Fi attacks has been super, super cool because it's, again, something that applies to so many different devices and it's relatively easy to learn. You need a little bit of a background in like networking in order to understand some of the more complicated interactions that are going on. But even with, you know, I failed one class in uh, routing and switching and I learned enough to do some pretty serious Wi-Fi hacking. And I also found that it's incredibly cheap to do this. I took a, an electronics class in community college and I really enjoyed it. But the one limitation was you know, doing things just with hardware that doesn't interact with other systems. As a hacker, like, didn't really interest me that much, honestly. It was these kind of low-cost Wi-Fi-enabled microcontrollers that had the ability to do very, like, basic and primitive stuff with Wi-Fi that it's kind of tricky to do with an integrated wireless card. You know, for something that costs, like, a eighty on AliExpress, it's pretty cool that you can do things like writing arbitrary packets or taking advantage of some of these really nuanced uh, things you can do with beacon frames in order to trick devices around you into behaving strangely. The device you're referring to, is a, is it an ESP32? Is that right? Mm. So specifically at the uh, $1.80 price point, this is the Wemos D1 Mini, which is based on the ESP8266, but it's an integrated module that has everything you need to plug it into a computer and then just start working with it to send packets um, totally arbitrarily. So that could be deauthentication packets or you know some new Wi-Fi attack that comes up tomorrow. You could write packets arbitrarily, just kind of like a wireless network adapter with this, but it does have some limitations in terms of the way it receives packets. So it like clips them. So you can never do something like a handshake attack where you're trying to like grab a Wi-Fi handshake because it would only be able to grab basically the packet metadata and, and not really much beyond that, just due to like limitations with how much power the chip has. And then you've got like Wi-Fi adapters from like Alpha. Alpha don't sponsor me to say this. I just like <laughs> They're my favorite as well. Frankly, we've worked with a lot of people and Alpha have always sent us the most stuff. And it's also excellent. They have sent me some stuff. A lot of stuff I bought myself, but they have sent me some adapters. So let's start with that, Cody. <laughs> which is your favorite adapter? I've got some, a whole bunch. I was in preparation. I just got a whole bunch. I was thinking, I don't know which one you're going to choose. But like, I want to find out about the Wi-Fi nugget because you've got that controller that you, sorry, the microcontroller that you've mentioned that's like $1.50 or $1.80, I think you said. And then you've got like the Wi-Fi nugget and then you've got this kind of stuff. So do you have any favorites? Oh, yeah. Why? Oh, yeah. I've got some serious opinions about the Alpha products. So I've tested Good, I like lots <laughs> of different Alpha products and most of them, again, are excellent. But if you don't like compromise and if you're not feeling subtle and if you also have uh, the double threat that somebody might you know, break into your home and you would need to like beat them to death with your wireless network adapter, the uh, TubeU is by far my favorite product that Alpha has ever created. It is designed for, I think, like boats or like buildings uh, or like really long distances. It looks like the bottom of a lightsaber. And one of the available antennas is just this huge, super long omnidirectional antenna that's like four or five feet long that is just ridiculous and does in fact look like, light like a lightsaber. But it also has the parabolic grid. So the parabolic grid is obviously huge. It ships in like folded onto like one thing, but you can break it out and and then like add the thing and it's like twice as big as they would be able to actually ship. It's, it's incredibly large, but it gets amazing distance. We clocked it at like five miles one time for receiving packets that had a known, uh, like a known location in Wiggle Wi-Fi. So if you're not feeling subtle and you don't want to stick to the traditional choices of like, do you want the ne or the na because of the weird way that they name their products? The TubeU is by far the most powerful and ridiculous wireless network adapter that I've used. And you can actually fit it inside a backpack. So, you know, if you, you don't need to scare people, but you would just have a very long USB cable coming out of your backpack that connects to a huge network adapter. In your tests, did you manage to do a hack at like that kind of distance or like a mile or two? Or, you know, I'm just trying to get an idea of like how far away you managed to do stuff. So, all right. So the way that we did this was in two phases. We brought a parabolic grid up to basically the Hollywood side in Los Angeles. First, we just scanned for networks and were able to receive networks from downtown Los Angeles from the Hollywood side. So that's a good, a good like five miles away. Um, and we were able to verify the location by feeding the information autonomously into wiggle.net and finding the geolocation of the networks we were seeing. So that was cool because we could actually see the spread of different networks we were observing with the antenna and see exactly where they were located in space. So we could see how directional the antenna was, for example. If I was like scanning for someone and I wanted to know what area of the city they were in, and I knew their phone's SSID and they were connected you know, to a Wi-Fi network, I could scan around the city and get a picture of like where someone was. So for location, um, that, that's pretty cool that you can do that at like five miles for actual interaction, being able to, for example, like deauthenticate someone and then get a handshake or something like that. 
we were seeing um, out to a little over a mile in order to have like a more interactive session. And that was, of course, clear line of sight and like a, a relatively powerful transmitter, like at the other end, like a nice router. But I mean, again, like the parabolic grid is very, very suspicious. We, I think we were sitting in a graveyard with this huge parabolic grid uh, on like a tripod. And we were getting like all this excellent distance because we only had a couple of targets we were allowed to connect to or allowed to hack. So we had to try to find a line of sight like to either like my apartment or like a friend's apartment or like a library that we were allowed to try to connect to. So it was pretty crazy trying to actually test that. Um, but yeah, it was it was a, a good experiment and it totally sold me on the two view. That's like, I would say high end. Yes. What about like small adapters like the, these? Do you have any favorites when it comes to these? Um, what it, the, is that the NE or the NA? The one at the bottom here is the, um, yeah, NHA. The NA, yeah. This one that only supports 2.4, is that right? It, it only supports 2.4 gigahertz, yes, but I found that it has always, for me, been the easiest um, wireless network adapter agree, to, yeah. to work with. It just This is my favorite. It's yeah. just so rock yeah. solid, and the drivers are so good for it that every Linux tool yeah. that you're going to want to try out on it is just going to work the first time. And that's not something I can say with all of their newer ones. They're great, and they can do way more. But if you're a beginner and you're just getting, you know, you're just doing kind of the standard stuff and you don't need to be chasing stuff on the 5 gigahertz, then it's so much simpler and it's so much more like rock solid that that's my default one unless I know that there's a target that's five gigahertz. And that's when sometimes I'll stray into the Panda wireless ones. While I prefer Alpha as a brand, Panda wireless has some just dirt cheap wireless network adapters that do five gigahertz that look like a USB drive. And like that to me will probably get the managers called on me less if I have too many wireless network adapters sticking out of my uh, computer and I'm at like a shared space or something, which has happened before. I've been, I've been uh, called out for Wi-Fi hacking because someone thought I had too many wireless network adapters plugged into my laptop. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. This is my favorite, just like you said, because you can just plug it in and it works. These are nice. People always complain, you know, they want to do five gigahertz, but like you said, you know, for beginners, it's a, it's a pain to get them to work. So yeah, let me ask you a nasty question while we're here. Kali or do you have another favorite operating system? Oh yeah, so we're gonna start a fight in the comments. Um, I like to do this one. Of course. Um, this is the most disruptive choice I have. I like to use Manjaro, which is technically Arch. So I get to say that I run Arch, but it has like a really nice uh, GUI over it. And it's just a really fun and nice operating system to use. I run it on a Raspberry Pi um, and I absolutely love it. And it's relatively easy to weaponize because there's the Black Arch repo, which you can load into it and boom, you have all the tools to stay out of the Kali versus Parrot debate. Um, I'll either say Ubuntu, which um, because normally people would disparage me, but because I have a YouTube channel, they 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 feel like they can't. They're like, oh, all right, fine. It's for babies, but fine. But I honestly really like you, Ubuntu. <laughs> it's so easy to run experiments and stuff that I find that the the fact that it's such a nice desktop operating system makes me want to use it more. But then my second choice would be, you know, for most things would be um, Manjaro. The older I get, the more it's like I just say, use the tool that's best for you. You know, is Mac or is Windows or Linux? You know. Hardcore guys will say, you have to run Linux. It's like, yeah, but what editing program am, am I going to use for my videos? So use the tool that's right for you. So you mentioned Raspberry Pi, and that gets us into a good conversation. What's the difference between a Raspberry Pi and a microcontroller? Because I still want to talk about the Wi-Fi nugget. Uh, at the moment, about $200. But uh, okay. on a technical level, the Raspberry Pi is something that is a computer you can plug into basically like a spare monitor, uh, plug in a keyboard, plug in a mouse, and you've got a computer. It runs an operating system. It runs programs that you're familiar with. It supports programming languages that you're familiar with. It's just a very full-fledged computer. And as a result, the price is supposed to be $35, but right now it's like more like $200 because there's a shortage. It's crazy. Um, and of course, there is a, sh a chip shortage that's affecting other areas, but I can still get a microcontroller that does like specifically Wi-Fi hacking for three bucks, five dollars. Um, and I can get you know something that does Wi-Fi and facial recognition for five bucks, you know? So like the fact that I can get a Wi-Fi connected camera that does facial recognition and has like all and has all these peripherals is so cool to me that I was very um, initially attracted to the Raspberry Pi as like the my preferred solution for hacking. My goal has always been as cheap as possible. Like I never had much money when I got started hacking, and I never wanted to do anything or teach anything 
that was so expensive that people who were just getting started wouldn't be able to do it. So if you fry a raspberry pie, it sucks, you know, like you mourn it a little yeah. bit because like that thing's like kind of expensive. It has a personality and I have enough now that I don't have to be precious about them, but I still like feel the loss of a raspberry pie. These little things are anonymous, you know, like I fry so many of these because I'm always experimenting with them and I'm hooking stuff up to them that I shouldn't be. And I don't care because I get a bag of a hundred of them. It's really cool to be able to scale ideas as well. Um, and not be bottlenecked by tons of cash. So perfect segue into the Wi-Fi nugget. Like we've been creating this little cat shaped packing tool that at its core is using these microcontrollers to be able to do all the magic stuff that it does. And the cool thing about it is we can make, you know, a hundred, a thousand of them. Um, and we don't have to be a huge company because unlike somebody who's buying up a hundred or a thousand raspberry pies, you know, I don't have to have a hundred thousand dollars to make a bunch of these and bring them to a conference and show people all the cool stuff that they can do. What does the Wi-Fi Nugget specifically do? Like, what's the or sort of what's the use case? Why would I buy one? Because I mean, I was looking at the website and I was thinking I should buy one of these. As soon as I fell in love with microcontrollers, there were two in particular that I really, really liked. The first one is the ESP8266, and that's the one that's really excellent for Wi-Fi hacking. And the second one is the ESP32S2, which supports native USB and makes it the perfect USB hacking tool. It, I mean, if you know like the USB rubber ducky, like it's really easy to create something that's just like that. And this is expensive as well, yeah. So that's a problem. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And like the fact that, you know, this little chip, and I have one right here, um, is about $4 on AliExpress. It has Wi-Fi, it has USB. That's like, oh, now I have a USB connectable, Wi-Fi, you know, remote accessible hacking tool here. And I can really make it into whatever I want. So I was like, what should, what should it be? Cat shaped. So because I have a cat that is completely <laughs> worthy of having projects dedicated to him, his nickname is the nugget. So we decided that like the physical incarnation of one of these chips that is basically um, everything you would want it to be in a handheld device. So what's cool about these microcontrollers, they can do all sorts of crazy hacking stuff, but what do you need to do in order to work with them? Well, you have to plug them into a computer, open up a command line application, and then like speak directly to the microcontroller, telling it exactly what to do in some language that it understands. That is way too much work for the average person. And yeah. I used to work a lot with uh, my friend uh, Stefan, aka Spacehoon, on his uh, Wi-Fi deauthor project, which has many incarnations. But my favorite one is the deauthor wristwatch. This is produced by like a friend of his in China, and it is everywhere. If you're on a like AliExpress or like Amazon, you see this thing absolutely everywhere. And the sad thing is Stefan doesn't really make very much money on this because of, uh, you know, other people copying the design. But what that design has done is, you know, taken the microcontroller and turned it into something that's, you could use like 80% of the features that I, you know, I just mentioned just by pressing a couple buttons and having a screen on it. And I was like, so inspired by that. I was like, this is so cool that you could unlock the potential of a microcontroller that somebody can use immediately either just by pressing buttons and having a screen or by connecting their phone and having a web interface. Like that's such a cool way of taking this kind of like, you know, locked up potential and opening it up for the average person. So that's when my friend Alex and I really started working on this Wi-Fi nugget design. We have a, a bear uh, nugget here. And then I have one in a case. It's like my personal nugget. It has like a lanyard and, and everything it has buttons. It has a screen, it has a NeoPixel, and then has a bunch of outputs that allow you to connect it to other things. And we would be able to scale this and be able to make, you know, tutorials around it, teach people about Wi-Fi hacking. The other thing that's cool is this is so powerful. It can host a web application. So when I'm teaching people about web, like web pen testing, I can have them download OWASP Zap, a very free, powerful, and excellent tool and then attack a vulnerable web application that connects to their Wi-Fi network, sits there, and you can pummel the hell out of it, and nobody will get upset at you. You can do such bad degrading things to this poor vulnerable web application, and no one's going to get upset because you're allowed to. This is legal, it's permissible, and I think that that's really the thing that my tutorials on Nullbyte kind of lacked, is like a punching bag that's always allowed, that's totally defensible, so that when people say like, hey, you're teaching criminals how to hack, I'm like, no. I'm giving them a safe place to learn this skill that's going to get them hopefully, you know, a job down the line, or at least like be able to carry their interest until they find out what it is they want to do. We created the Wi-Fi Nugget by just taking this D1, uh, this D1 mini module that I'd worked with so much and then marrying it to a cat shaped board that broke it out and allowed you to, you know, do all the stuff with it. But right around that time, um, they came out with the S2 mini. So what's cool is that um, these are pin compatible. Like you can plug one into something that's meant for the other. 
And I was like, what a lucky coincidence. I wonder if this new board they just came out with would actually be more useful or more powerful than the D1 Mini. So I took the S2 Mini, I plugged it into our existing design with zero modifications whatsoever, and it works perfectly. We really got lucky in that um, we didn't need to change our design at all from the Wi-Fi nugget to the USB nugget. We literally just had to put a different microcontroller on the back and suddenly it has completely new powers and you know new abilities. You can flash it, is that right, to get it to do different things. And one of those is the Wi-Fi deauthor, is that correct? That's right. So anything that works on the ESP8266 will work on the Wi-Fi nugget. What's cool is it can send arbitrary packets, meaning it can like create fake Wi-Fi networks around you. Um, you can plug it in and control it with your computer, or you can connect to it over Wi-Fi and control it with the web interface. Um, it's really cool. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Um, the only thing you can't do with it is it doesn't truly act like a wireless network adapter in that it can't sniff packets beyond just the headers. So it clips all the packets that it's receiving. The nice thing is you can still do war driving, you know, if you want to go around and just gather information about networks around you, but you cannot do like Wi-Fi hacking. You, you cannot do like actually grabbing a handshake because that part of the message is just never fully received and processed by the microcontroller. So is it a way of doing some cool offensive Wi-Fi stuff? Yes. But is it something that will do like the full range of, of actions you would expect like a wireless network adapter from Alpha Wireless to do? No, it won't. And that's an important thing to remember when comparing this directly to a wireless network adapter. Because like, can you do like a new Wi-Fi attack by just like having it send arbitrary packets uh, that are formatted however you want? Yes, just like a, an Alpha Wireless network adapter. But then can you receive the response and get all the data? Maybe not. That's where you might need to use your computer's wireless network adapter in you know, monitor mode to get the, the same result. But it's still, in my opinion, cheaper than like a, you know, getting your own like alpha wireless network adapter or something for an experiment that just needs uh, something that's broadcasting, not receiving a bunch of data. Does it run Arduino or I think you it actually runs some Python, is that right? The ESP8266 is capable of running Arduino, uh, which is basically C++. And then also it can run MicroPython. So MicroPython takes a little bit to get started with, but once you get it up and running, it can be a really good experience for people who have a little bit of Python knowledge to be able to start working with microcontrollers using an interpreted language rather than a compiled one, which is great because you can run code live and it's very uh, forgiving, I would say, compared to Arduino. Arduino always makes me feel like I'm not a good enough computer scientist. MicroPython makes me feel like I'm getting away with something I shouldn't be allowed to get away with. And it might actually be making me a worse programmer sometimes because it really like it just it just takes what I tell it to do and, and really does some good faith work there. The other microcontroller, the ESP32 S2, this actually supports CircuitPython. CircuitPython is different than MicroPython because it's supported by Adafruit. And if you've never heard of Adafruit, they're a fantastic hardware company that also does some of the most amazing support for beginners who are wanting to get into hardware programming. So because this supports native USB and it supports CircuitPython, if you flash it with CircuitPython, you can plug it into your computer open up an editor and start writing Python directly onto it because it mounts as a USB drive. You just save your Python file directly to the drive and it runs. I've never seen such a simple experience for people who you know, maybe have never worked with the compiled language before, but they do have great experience with Python. It's just such an easy way to get started using something you already know to control something that maybe you've never interacted with before. And it's probably my favorite thing about this microcontroller is how easy it is for beginners to get started using it. And the fact that it can mount as a USB drive to allow you to just drag and drop stuff that you want to do on it. So CircuitPython is a major uh, thing I'm excited about for the USB nugget. And it also has the, um, the USB nugget software that it comes with, which is a HID attack tool that we've been developing in cooperation with Hack5. That acts like kind of like a Wi-Fi connectable uh, USB rubber ducky, but with buttons. So you can deploy multiple payloads uh, with just three button presses for uh, whichever operating system you want, really, you know, Linux, Mac OS, uh, like Android, like iOS, like you can add as many as you want. And um, it's also got a web interface. So if you want to use some other device to connect to it remotely, maybe from a, you know, like a mile away, if you wanted to, then you could plug this into a computer connect to it remotely, and then either run scripts live or select a script that you already have saved and run it whenever it's convenient. It supports a rubber ducky scripts, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah, so Hack5 has been wonderful about kind of taking us under their wing and teaching us how to make these products. We've never done this before. Um, Alex and I do not have experience you know, bringing like a product to market, but Hack5 does because they've done it a bunch of times. 
So we've yeah. been working with MG, the creator of the OMG cable, who has been- yeah, MG's great. Yeah, he's been our mentor, honestly, yeah. like like guiding us through the process of like buying these microcontrollers, sourcing them, like, like mass producing them, because people really like this thing that we've created and it's really powerful and expandable. And there's, again, for beginners, so much content out there on CircuitPython to just be able to do, you know, basic IoT stuff or make your own prototype to do virtually anything you want. The problem is like, you know, being able to make sure you don't buy, for example, a batch of bad microcontrollers, as we potentially accidentally just did to the tune of like 500 of them that might not be sellable. Oh, wow. So, you know, these are pitfalls that come with trying to scale up and like bring this product to other people. Like we wanted to make a big run of these to do a DEF CON. And instead we've ended up with a crisis where we might have to bodge wire one pin on the 500 different microcontrollers in order to get them to work properly. It's really a journey to go from making something that's just for us, like a research tool or something that's for like hacking and just trying to make it as useful as possible to bringing it to everybody else and making sure that we can respond to customer feedback, like make sure that if there's a really bad bug, it gets fixed super quickly. And also like, you know, dealing with design flaws, like the fact that when you have these modules, they're really, the screen is really fragile and you can break it very, very easily. We designed and manufactured now a 3D printed case to make sure that the most fragile part of the screen is like locked underneath some like hard 3D printed plastic. And that it's more convenient to use by breaking out the buttons into a D-pad and having the peripherals on the back like exposed, but not in a way that's going to cause components to get stuck or damaged or something like that. Going through and finding ways that people are breaking our product and then, you know, reacting has been kind of a, like a cat and mouse game, but it's been... Um, it's been a lot of fun, honestly, being able to create physical objects, uh, like 3D printed cases, like digital circuits, and then software all in one project. It really like scratches every itch you can imagine for somebody who wants to create something from nothing. It's amazing. I mean, when I spoke to MG, and I'm getting the same, that's why I laughed when I, I get the same feeling when I'm talking to you. It's like, this is not something I want to do. I'll do software. <laughs> Hardware is hard. It's like you said, he said, he, you know, the same thing. To scale is such a nightmare. It's so hard to scale. Are there any other like crazy difficult things that you've had to overcome? I mean, every every week it feels like there's a new one of those. Uh, <laughs> the supply chain problems we've had over the last, I guess, year now, like chip shortage, right? Yeah, like, you've been saying that you, it's like 18 months or some crazy lead time. And they took me about four hours per cable to make. Wow. And half of them were bad. Man, I, f I feel for you guys. So, but I appreciate you going through all the pain to make it easier for us. You have to, you have to love it, you know? Um, if, if you don't really love this, then the goal of just like making a thing isn't worth the pain of spending all this money and all this time on something that is honestly super frustrating a lot of the time. You have to love the people that you work with and you have to love the thing that you're doing in order for this to even make sense, unless you're a pretty big company with the resources to just sink into a project that just might not work. It's just two of you, isn't it's it? It's just two of us. And that's the thing. Like, it's so hard for us to maintain this project. We focus on one uh, product at a time. So right now we're focusing on the USB Nugget because it's our partnership with Hack5. These chips are amazing. And I know that they're going to be, we're going to be working with this chip like forever. It's going to be a long time that we're using the ESP32 S2 because it's an awesome chip. But, you know, like just doing the content around it, doing the documentation, the website, the art, for the circuit boards, there's a little drawing of my cat, the nugget on the back of the circuit board. And like there's packaging, the software, the bug reports, the customer feedback, the, the people getting confused and like soldering it wrong. Like this is so much work for two people that if we didn't have like the specific experience that we have, like content creation, um, Alex is like very into creating hardware and has been doing that for quite some time. Software creation, um, like being able to set up a store, being able to like manage a supply chain. That's like random experience I had at a totally different job. If we didn't have those exact skills that came from completely outside of cybersecurity, we could not do this. I actually, when you're talking now, I think I've got a bit of a better understanding, but I'd like you to highlight it. What's the difference between the Wi-Fi nugget and the USB nugget? I see it's like the ESP, so the, the actual controllers you're using is different yep. and the functionality is different. Is that yes. right? Yes. So we learned from Hack5 that nobody cares about the inside of the product. You, when when no. you're making a product, you should have it do a very specific thing and advertise the coolest thing that it does and really forget exactly, about explaining yeah. like what's inside the box. So for a long time, we called um, the, the Wi-Fi nugget was the D1 nugget. And then the USB nugget was the S2 nugget. But then we decided on uh, like, what is the coolest thing that the D1 nugget does? Well, the ESP8266 is great at hacking Wi-Fi and most of the, the different things that we have for it hack Wi-Fi. So let's call it the Wi-Fi nugget. 
and make people's expectations in line with what this microcontroller can do. And then for the S2 Nugget, we're like, all right, what can this do? It has native USB and it's able to do all these awesome USB attacks. Like, all right, it's the USB Nugget because you know it's focused on uh, USB attacks. Now, previously, we had called it the Rubber Nugget. And I thought this was very, very, very cute and cool and kind of a callback to the um, the rubber ducky. But Darren was just yeah. like, stop that. It's too close to it. Like, it doesn't say what it does. It's a cute name, but like, it doesn't, you know, compared to the Wi-Fi nugget, like, it's very clear what the Wi-Fi nugget does. It hacks Wi-Fi. After our initial run with Hack 5, the decision we, we came to for like how to explain what this platform can do. But like, can it also do other like non-USB stuff? Of course. Like, you can run CircuitPython on it. You can do Wi-Fi stuff on it as well. But there is one interesting limitation, and this is because I'm a nerd. So um, the the company that makes these microcontrollers was not super stoked about how popular they became for Wi-Fi hacking. So as soon as they realized that this is what something people something that um, people were just going to keep doing, they locked it down. And uh, my friend Stefan was able to go back and actually find an older version of the SDK that allowed him to get around the restriction and do arbitrary packet writing, and thus the the Wi-Fi deauthor was born. They've gotten much better at locking this down since then. And because this is a new chip and there's no old version of it that wasn't locked down, you cannot do arbitrary like Wi-Fi packet writing with the ESP32 S2, even though it's more powerful. And even though it's newer, it, it just doesn't work because of the restrictions that the company has put into place. While you can do receiving uh, with this, so theoretically you could grab like a Wi-Fi handshake, you can't do like Wi-Fi deauthentication de attacks. So that's why we chose not to like kind of emphasize the Wi-Fi abilities of the USB nugget because it can't do everything that the uh, ESP8266 can do in terms of arbitrary writing, which you would honestly expect from something that's like replacing or otherwise supplementing a, a wireless network adapter. That's kind of the, the big difference between the two is the fact that Espressif, the company that makes these, has like gone through the trouble of locking this down from the start in this newer chip just means that it's a little bit less useful for the offensive Wi-Fi uh, capabilities that the older chip, ironically, because there's older ways of programming it out there that still allow this ability, um, let you let you do. If I want to hack Wi-Fi, I'd get the Wi-Fi nugget. I could do deauth attacks as an example. Mm -hmm. If I want to do like a rubber ducky slash um, OMG cable type attack, I would get the USB nugget. This has Wi-Fi in addition to like being able to run rubber ducky scripts onto a computer to automate attacks as an example. And it's got a nice little form factor. Am I saying that correctly or is there, am I missing some stuff? No, that's it. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly it. And of course, like there's all this other stuff as like a, a nerd that you can go and change and do and flash and other projects that support. But really like most people just want to know like what the coolest thing it can do is. And that's exactly it. I saw in another video, you can flash this with a browser, is that right? And load CircuitPython on it, is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so my favorite way of being able to interact with this microcontroller is the browser. Unfortunately, right now, Web Serial only supports Google Chrome, but if you have Google Chrome, you can um, hit the reset button on this microcontroller, plug it in, and then just automatically flash whatever binary you want to put on it. So switching between projects is as easy as holding down the reset button, plugging it in, uh, going to a, a web URL and then selecting the firmware that you want to put on the microcontroller. And it does it all in the browser without needing to open a single command line application. I think that that was really like what makes this so beginner cool. friendly because previously we had to do all sort of, you know, install Arduino and flash it, like install like ESP tool. Doing this all through the browser eliminates all of that. We no longer have to ask people, oh, what operating system are you running? Oh, have you tried this driver? You know, it's, it's such a pain to have to go through a command line tool or something for beginners. And this is really what I think is like the last step in making these microcontrollers more accessible to new users is making it so they don't have to install a bunch of proprietary stuff on their computer in order to try out different projects on it. I have a lot of proof of concepts that I love to write in CircuitPython that Alex will then go and turn into like a full-fledged you know, tool that's written in Arduino. Uh, because it's much more efficient for space and you can get much more lower level control of the hardware and really do you know what the proof of concept is trying to do, but much more elegantly. And that's kind of our system. I will create a CircuitPython rough, very rough prototype of something we want to develop as a feature or a new product. And then Alex will come along and deconstruct my code, turn it into something that's much more clean and uses the resources of the microcontroller better, and then releases it as a binary file people can just directly flash to the board. If they want to muck around with it, they can open my CircuitPython spaghetti code and you know change stuff and like make their own version. 
Or if they just want to run the tool that we've created, the proof of concept, then they can do that. And they can make it really, really simple to get started with uh, like just doing the basic thing that we're trying to teach without needing to know how to program at all. And that's like, you know, running a deliberately vulnerable web application. Like, you know, you're trying to learn OWASP Zap, not how to compile some software. So the ability to go to a exactly. browser, flash it over, and then be attacking a vulnerable web application that's connected to your Wi-Fi network within a couple minutes, like that to me is what makes us so beginner friendly. I've been training people for years and I think I always talk about the curse of knowledge. If you know too much, you know, you, you just know too much to, and someone who's new just doesn't have that knowledge. So I, I love it that you're making it simple. So if I am interested in ethical hacking and I want to learn about like microcontrollers and perhaps Arduino, stuff like that, is this, is this something that I can start with and then like learn a bit of Python, learn some Arduino, um, but then also do like hacking type stuff? Because always, it's like you said, you need a reason to have a product. And it's the same thing for learning. If I want to learn, I want to learn in a hacking context. Is, is this kind of like a project that I could look at? Yes. So um, I like to think that this is adult Legos um, uh, as, yeah. as in terms of like how complicated it is or what, what kind of mindset you need to bring to it. The reason I love that our USB Nugget supports CircuitPython and we can plug in with them is they are so focused on making it an easy experience for a beginner with no knowledge to come in and make a prototype. What is the prototype? You decide. Um, I saw a really cool one that was just like an LED strip that had a distance set, like an ultrasonic distance sensor that as you walk, it follows you with the light above. You know, something really simple like that that's taking a value and mapping it to an LED, a beginner could do in three or four days. Like somebody who hasn't done programming before could look up the guides on uh, getting the sensor value and then look up a guide on writing to a NeoPixel strip. And they could do that. I, I could confidently say with maybe a little bit of guidance in just a couple of days. If you maybe bring in a, a cybersecurity kind of like concept to it and make it so, okay, when the distance sensor senses the person is nearby, run a script to like, you know, put up a, a fake desktop or something. And you could make like a prank device. What I think is so magical about microcontrollers is you can come up with an idea that nobody's done before, but there are, are chunks of it out there, like code examples on circuit Python that like show you how to use something like a, a passive infrared receiver to know when someone's coming or when someone's nearby and then trigger your device. You can really rig your own thing, whatever it is, and treat them like Lego blocks and plug them into each other and have them work in a way that I think has never been possible before for beginners um, who don't have a lot of programming experience, who don't know how to do compiled languages, for example. CircuitPython's amazing and, and Python's amazing because it gives you the ability to come with a little bit of interpreted language knowledge and really make a big dent in like a hardware project and make something that fe you feel ownership for. And that's why I think like the, the, the Wi-Fi nugget, the USB nugget, they're both really good places for beginners to start because they're such well-supported chips with so many different ways of using them that no matter what your idea is, I think that you could probably pull it off provided it's reasonable and within the capabilities of the actual hardware. Because there's just so many examples out there uh, of, of people doing a project pretty similar to yours with great code examples and lots of community input that I think the community, for example, around the Raspberry Pi um, that people love so much, uh, you know, you get a Raspberry Pi, there's a hundred things you can do with it. It's the same thing in the microcontroller community around some of these really excellent and uh, very well-used boards that have been adopted by companies like Adafruit, who are, you know, very, very diligent about making sure this experience is as easy as the technology allows it to be. So rather than going to learn Arduino and trying to understand C, I could start with CircuitPython. Is that, is that correct? Did I understand that right? You could make an inefficient, kind of crappy CircuitPython version of the exact same thing um, that will sometimes randomly crash, but it will work in CircuitPython. What is to learn? So, um, yeah. Exactly. And that's why, why if I have an idea and I want to see it now, you know, I can do it in an yeah. hour if I if I know what I'm trying to do and I look up some Stack Overflow stuff and I, I look up at the CircuitPython documentation and that I can't do that in Arduino. Here's the difference. You have to plan out what you want to do in Arduino or it's not going to work. You know, if you don't know what you're you're trying to program beforehand, then it's going to be more, much more difficult to change your mind in the middle of an Arduino program. With CircuitPython, have fun is like the first rule. You can 
totally change your mind for what you're doing in the middle of your circuit Python program. And it, it just works, you know? So that kind of looseness with an idea where maybe you're a beginner and you're copying someone else's code and you don't understand what this change does. So you need to like change it back and, and go back and like see how it runs. Circuit Python is amazing for that. You know, if you have experience with Python versus another language that is, uh, you know, like C or C++, like you know the difference is that Python lets you get away with some funky stuff that beginners tend to do. So I think that for encouragement to feel like you're, you know, a good enough programmer to make prototypes, CircuitPython will support you, encourage you, and maybe even teach you some bad habits sometimes. But I think it's worth it in terms of letting people feel the power of, you know, thinking about something that doesn't exist yet and then making it with their own hands and their own programming skills. You know, we're not building Facebook yet. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, building, we're building a little thing for ourselves or just a proof of concept. So it doesn't have to be the most efficient. It just has to work in our specific example. So I love that, that you can take Python um, for like coding uh, Raspberry Pi or coding Windows or whatever, and then do it with uh, microcontrollers. Do I buy the Wi-Fi nugget if I'm interested in more Wi-Fi kind of-ish stuff? Or, and then I buy the USB uh, nugget for like other types of things, is that right? I would say yes. Uh, if you want to do Wi-Fi hacking attacks, if you want to support, uh, you know, like the Wi-Fi deauthor is one of the supported projects and try that out as well. Some of the stuff we've written that's custom. Um, you can definitely grab the Wi-Fi nugget, but if you're interested in the Circuit Python, the um, uh, all the like USB features that like make that really easy to use, I would say the USB nugget is where to go right now. We're putting most of our development energy into it, and the fact that it plugs into uh, Circuit Python and Adafruit's environment so well is what makes it my favorite product at the moment, and the one that we're really champion, championing. Champion! Oh my God, we're really putting it forward. Because uh, it is uh, something that has so many different applications that aside from, you know, selling it as a hacking tool, like using it as a way to teach programming is something that we're really interested in doing for environments where people really like it, but they're like, uh, I don't know about the offensive hacking stuff. Is there like something a little lighter you can do? And we're like, yeah, name it. You know, like we got sensors, we got uh, NeoPixel strips, like there's all sorts of like fun like projects you can do. Like I, I've created a weather station out of one, out of a spare nugget just because I had it on hand and it was literally yeah. the easiest way to, you know, combine like a, uh, like Hall effect sensor to get like the speed of like something spinning in the wind and then like a, like a temperature and humidity sensor and then broadcast it as a Wi-Fi network name. So if I open up my phone and look at my Wi-Fi, I can see that, um, I've got a, U, a USB out nugget, a USB nugget out there acting as a, uh, like, temperature sensor slash weather station and broadcasting as a network name, the current conditions. So it was just the easiest way to do it. And I think that that's why the USB nugget is the way to go so far. Uh, where can you buy this? Can you buy this on Hack5 or will it be on Hack5 one day or where, where can you buy this? So we've sold 250 of them on Hack5 so far. We have another batch of 500 that we're looking to be selling on Hack5 pretty soon. So if you are a Hack5 customer or if you're registered for their email alerts, hint, hint, that is how we're probably going to be releasing the next batch. Like it won't just show up on the website because we're going to sell out. We sold out 250 in like less than 48 hours. Now it's just like trying to make sure we have enough for a release. But um, little little hint, you can always buy one on hackcat.com, H-A-K-C-A-T.com. Um, because, you know, that's where that's where we sell them uh, ourselves all the time. We actually make a little bit of extra money um, when, when you buy it from our website. And the reason we do that is like, I don't have a Patreon. Um, we've never had a Patreon. We haven't had one for Nullbyte. We haven't had one for our Hack5 stuff. It just feels like I owe people stuff and I don't have something to give them. So I would rather, if you want to support us, you buy this microcontroller and get something out of, you know, giving us $80 than uh, just like supporting us on Patreon for a couple months and then not getting that much for it. We put so much work into this product and the, the content around it, making sure it's easy for people to get started with it, that they can always find like guides on how to use it. That um, really that's like our version of Patreon is making hardware that we support with our work on a monthly basis so that people who want to support us um, have the option of like learning along with us. And also like, frankly, it's people are so wonderful. Like our customers have been so forgiving of like our design iterations and like some mistakes we've made. We've shipped out a lot of replacement nuggets um, just because like our community has been so kind and helpful in getting us up to speed and making a product for Hack5 that it's been an incredible experience. So you can always get one on hackhat.com. Oops. You can always get one on hackhat.com. Um, or if you want to buy it through Hack5, sign up for their email alerts. And we will be eventually mass producing this and making it a product on Hack5, but we'll be doing some sneaky releases 
uh, as well as hopefully selling a lot of them at DEF CON. So if you're at DEF CON in person, we're going to have um, our own cat girls uh, and cat boys out there selling the uh, the Wi-Fi nugget at the Hack5 booth, and you can pick one up. But I could buy one like right now, yeah, from, from your website. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah both USB nugget and Wi-Fi right. nugget are available for sale on hackhive.com, and we'll have the USB nugget, I believe, actually at uh, DEF CON. Are you doing presentations or are you speaking at conferences? Do you have like online training on Udemy? You know, where can I learn from you? Because let's, I want to learn this product from you. Where can I go? Or what, what resources can you recommend? So there's a couple of different things that we like to do to connect with people who are like learning the stuff that we're working with or, or the, the uh, hardware that we're putting out. One of them is online classes. Um, so we do in-person workshops in Los Angeles every so often, but we also do online classes where you will know, we'll do a complete workshop on how to use Hack5 tools uh, like you know, the upcoming USB nugget. We mostly do that through a meetup group called Cyber Weapons Lab LA. So if you're into in-person meetups, if you want to check out some of our in like uh, you know like online trainings that you can still we're live, you can ask us questions. We'll go through and take a look at your work, and we have a little CTF at the end. Then um, Cyber Weapons Lab LA is the meetup group that we've been organizing those through. So I could attend that from the UK. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So the, I mean, the hours might be a little funky, so you might be drinking coffee in sure. order to keep up with us. But we've <laughs> tried to take it from you know supporting our local like hackerspace by doing events there locally to trying to reach out to people who you know really want to go through uh, a more thorough like class or learn like Ducky Script in the context of also having like a you know a Wi-Fi remote interface that you can like programmatically access. Like there's so many cool things you can do that we don't cover um, that we we decided to start doing more of these online sorts of trainings um, through the meetup group. So of course we're gonna be making free content because that's that's what we do. You know, we make as much as possible. And I figure if somebody buys the product, I wanna make sure they at least have access to like a quick start guide and the ability to get started with virtually anything they wanna try. But for all of the kind of far out things that like we do, um, as we're like experimenting with like the absolute limits of what this microcontroller can do. Um, yeah, we'll be doing more online training and I'm going to be doing a talk called uh, $5 Cyber Weapons and How to Use Them at the Hope Conference in New York. That's going to be a really fun talk. I think it's going to be recorded. So if you can't make it, then um, that's okay. You can still uh, check it out. And we're going to be doing a, a workshop there as well. So we haven't figured out what exactly uh, the nugget related workshop is going to be. We might do a CTF. We might do like a soldering workshop where people are actually putting them together because we designed these to be beginner friendly enough that you can how with no soldering experience before be able to put one of these together and probably not burn too many of the components. But it, we, we've had really good success with people with very shaky hands at our workshop still managing to put these together. So um, we're going to be doing either a soldering workshop or a CTF at Hope, and hopefully we'll be able to have some people come by and uh, show us some cool stuff that maybe we haven't even thought of before. That's great. So, I mean, you've got um, free content. Is that on YouTube, on your YouTube channel? Is that yep. right? Hack5. Oh, so it's going to be on Hack5 directly. Yep. Yeah. It's not on Security Forward, yeah? Um, we'll be covering it on Security Forward every so often, but Hack5 is where we do our tutorial style videos. So all the, the best free content around the Nugget will probably be on Hack5. And then people can um, attend uh, the Cyber Weapons Lab LA. That's a meetup. Yep. Right? They they can join virtually. Um, or they can attend the Hope Conference, um, but that could that'll also be a, perhaps available on YouTube or somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And if you if people have questions, then on the Security Forward channel, we do the live Q and A every week. And if you've got a Nugget question, like that's valid. Like come to it, uh, come to us and ask us a Nugget yeah. question. We'll answer it in front of everyone. That's the Hacking with Friends show, and that's where we do a live stream Q and A, which is also broadcast on the Hack Five channel. But then also we do a weekly breakdown of all the security news that is uh, just on that channel. And then if you want to take part in one of our more advanced classes, then you know we like to organize the meetups. If we can do them in person, we'd love to support like local hacker spaces, and that's why we've done them in LA so frequently. But we're going to start doing the online ones because too many people are buying nuggets, you know, like or not too many, but you know, like too many to fit in a room. We're going to try to make it easier for people who have bought a nugget to you know hang out with us, like. Tell us what you've done with it. Tell us what did and didn't work so we can make it better and also teach you guys all the cool stuff that we've learned to do with these microcontrollers in this cat shape platform. I was watching some of the videos on Security Forward and I love it because you are just getting like these random questions and you're just answering <laughs> them straight away. Like you went from like talking about nuggets to talking about like just people in the industry to talking about like a whole bunch of Wi-Fi hacking questions. I love it that you're just like there answering questions. So if anyone wants to learn from Cody and I highly suggest you do, please, you know, subscribe to his YouTube channels. I'll put the links below. Go follow him on Twitter. Cody, those are sort of the best places to, to interact with you. Is that right on the live streams and on Twitter. Yeah. And if you ever want to find me, you can go to hack.gay because that's my personal website and it has a kind of a map of uh, where a bunch of my content is. Cody, I really want to thank you 
you know, for sharing. And thank you for creating a product like this. Talking to you and MG, man, I, I'm not brave enough. I'll, I'll stick to software. But thanks so much for, you know, going through the pain and sharing the passion with all of us. Um, any closing words before before we wrap up? When you work with friends and you work on projects that you would do for free anyway, even the, the pain and even the, the setbacks are worth it. It feels like something where if you were set up and doing the kind of stuff, I guess, like lazy rich people do, it would never be as satisfying as getting into the thick of it and really accomplishing something by like working with people you really admire um, to create something that you think is genuinely super cool. Like that's something that I've never gotten to do before. And that's probably the coolest part of all this. Like, obviously, yes, it's super hard. It's really the ability to work with who I want and be able to like end up making something that I can show total beginners and they think it's like wildly cool. That's like probably the coolest thing I've ever done. So the last, the, the pandemic has actually been like a, a unique and kind of cool experience in forcing me to stop doing as much content and instead focus on this new project, which is so technical and like, you know, hardware based, like constrained by supply chain stuff. Like it's really been for me, a wake up call that I should have done this earlier. You know, like I, I should have like tried to and failed maybe at making something because the payoff for when you do hit on something that works is so much that, um, yeah, it, it's really as much fun or more fun than creating content. So it's been great. But you're a great content creator as well. And I mean, years of content creation shows. I mean, you're so humble about your knowledge, but I mean, I've seen a lot of your videos on Nullbyte. Um, and on other places. I mean, you really know what you're talking about. It's funny that you uh, say that I really know my stuff because I've always seen myself as a beginner. Like when I started doing the channel, the the, per, the person who had been the the admin of Nullbyte before me, the, the website, not the YouTube channel, um, was like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's got a Mac computer. You know, they're just hiring anyone now. And the fact that I was like, okay, I'm a beginner. That's cool. I can deal with that. Um, and that's who I've been like on YouTube and publicly, like, you know, I'm a beginner that's trying to learn just alongside everyone else. I'm not saying I'm the end all authority. I'm just like somebody else who loves learning this stuff and is happy to share it with other people who are on the same journey. That's where I am. So like, I, you know, o over such a long period of time, I think I have learned a lot because I've, I've, you know, taken on like teaching other people things that I myself really wanted to know. Um, but yeah, it, it takes time and like, you're never, an, I, I never feel like an expert. Um, you know, I always feel like I have so much more to learn and that that's the point of making content is being able to take other people along the journey of being an, like a total amateur to at least somebody that has something else to share in terms of experience. I've been doing stuff for, in, in, in tech for a long time, man, every day you learn and every day you feel that you know nothing, Humbled. I think. <laughs> yep. I think if, if you get to the point where you feel like you know everything, then you've, then you've lost it. Definitely. Because you 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 got to just keep on learning. That's when people get defensive and they don't have anything else to learn. So yeah, no, I, I share that. The the cyber industries uh, can be interesting. I I, I um people um people are not always the nicest and friendliest, which is sad. But um, you know, I'm glad that you didn't let anything stop you and you just went for it. You know, I mean, you, you're so humble to say you know nothing because, or to say you, you're a beginner because you're definitely not. I feel like um, if you go into this sort of thing and you like make it your whole ass personality. Like it's a, it's, you get backed into a corner by other people knowing more than you. And like, you feel threatened by other people's success um, because it feels like they're coming for you in a way that like, it probably feels very scary for people who, you know, the, them feeling like the master of one particular subject is like what makes them who they are. One thing I've learned is like, you can't make it your whole personality. You can't make it your whole, like who you are. Like, you know, this is definitely my passion, but there's so many other like, making art and like, you know, urban exploration, all these other things that like, I, I love that make me who I am. But like, if somebody calls me an amateur at cybersecurity, like I've been called worse things, you know? <laughs> and if you're a content creator, you're gonna get it. Exactly, exactly. We, we, we had like people who are like so privileged and like, you know, going to a great school, getting a job at Booz Allen and the people on Nolbit were like, pizza face, like, what are you doing here? You know, and it's just like, you just get abuse from nowhere sometimes. And you like, it, it's hard for new people sometimes to like tolerate that. Um, but you know, you, you make such good friends um, that it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, uh, any content creator gets hate. Um, it's, um, yeah, you gotta ignore it. Um, and I'm glad you have, I'm glad you've risen above that and just carried on. Well, um, I mean, I was and, I was um, gonna say um, you've also like the 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 fact that I've gone um, in two years to seeing your content like absolutely everywhere 
and like the the kinds of things that you're selecting and the ways that you're like learning to like put things out. I, I don't know. Like I'm also very impressed. It, it makes me happy to see other people Thank that you. are like learning things that I myself haven't had the, the space to learn because I picked something and I stuck with it. Like when I was preparing for the RSA conference and going through like all this new content that's come out over the last couple of years, like I was really impressed with yours. Like it, it makes me happy to see people out there Thanks. that are like doing um like I think a real service to people who want to get into the industry and like don't want to have it make up their whole personality and have to feel like a badass expert who's like mean to other people um, who are less technical than them, you know? Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. I mean, it's when you've been doing it long enough, you realize there's always an 18 year old kid that knows more than you in some <laughs> field. There's always some person somewhere who knows much more than you. And, you know, you just got to do the best you can. Yeah. Now, I appreciate you sharing. Cody, all the best. Thank you. Any question you're not happy with, just say, no, David, or something. Or like, sl like slam my hands down on the table and shout, what kind of interview is this? That's it. <laughs> Have a tantrum. That would be great content, actually. <laughs> Should we start with, right with that? That's going to be our intro, yeah. My favorite thing to do on the set of Null Bite um, was to take a giant swig of water, choke on it after we've gotten everything set up, and then cough for 10 to 15 minutes while everyone waits for me. <laughs>